book, uh, one of the oldest in China, called The Fourth Book of Shen Hai Ching. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's entitled The Classic of Eastern Mountains. Now, just before 2000 BC, uh, it, there are four sections in this old book recording um, the, the visit of a survey party which went to North America. And uh, they call the Pacific Ocean the Eastern Sea, and that they went to the other side of the Eastern Sea. Now, each section begins by describing the geographical features of a particular mountain. Uh, its height, its shape, the mineral deposits they found, uh, surrounding rivers, types of flora, and so on. And then it points the direction and the distance to the next mountain, and so on. Right. It's like a road map of North America. And by following the clues, it's been discovered that these sections describe in detail the total topography of the western and central North America. And each mountain can be identified in each river. Now, this was a geographical survey, a systematic survey. But, Rob, that's not all. It even gives the experiences of the surveyors, from uh, picking up black opals and gold nuggets in Nevada. Wow to watching seals frolic on the rocks in San Francisco Bay. And they recorded their fascination at a strange animal that avoided danger by pretending to be dead. Obviously the native opossum. Yes. And you can read about their wonder at the Grand Canyon, which they described as a stream flowing in a bottomless ravine. And they described the sunrise there. That's in the ninth and the 14th books. Now, by the 3rd century BC, uh, when many Chinese records were re-evaluated and condensed, mm -hmm. it was found that the geographical learning that this old book contained no longer corresponded to any lands that they knew in China at the time. So it was reclassified as a myth. But now we know better. It was when uh, Richard Nixon's uh, group went across to China and they started exchanging uh, cultural information, East and West, that this book came to light. And it's the oldest survey of North America. I remember from the last time you were with us that also the ancient Egyptians and Phoenicians were in North America as well. They, had, they really did, yes. Yeah. And in the Grand Canyon, um, there, there was a, an explorer who belonging to the Smithsonian Institute yeah. who went down there and, and discovered the caves uh, with, with all the Egyptian artifacts in it. You know, I, I remember reading history books when I was young that were talking about uh, the the people from the other side of the ocean, the east. Now I'm talking about from North America to the east, which would be, uh, you know, Egypt and, and the Phoenicians and so on, that would come over here and trade with the Indians for copper. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And there were copper mines. Yep. So why aren't the kids taught this in school? Why does this information have to be suppressed? Well, unfortunately, uh, a theory has been popularized uh, which uh, is at the root of all this. Uh, we, I call it the big E, or the evolution theory, as we know it. Uh, the evolution theory uh, cannot allow for man in the past being so clever. We have to be taught that man was from a beast or some kind of animal in the past, evolving. His intelligence came gradually, and first he was hunting and dragging his women around by the hair and, and into caves and so on. And then later on he began to plant, and later on he discovered fire. Later on he began to live together and, and form cities, and later on came technology and intelligence. So that's the evolution theory, and it, it's quite opposite from what now we're finding in the archaeological uh, research. As, a, as an explorer and as an archaeologist, what is, is your opinion of Darwin's theory? Was Darwin correct? If Darwin had lived, was alive today, he would not have publicized his theory, because when he publicized that theory, the science of, of uh, the various sciences that we know today were, were not refined. In fact, uh, the science of uh, DNA and, and uh, genetics was, was unknown. Mm -hmm. Also, biology was in its infancy. Uh, archaeology, of course, uh, didn't exist virtually. It was still uh, b beginning. Uh, if Darwin was alive today, he would repudiate uh, much of what he wrote. In fact, he did say 
that um, there was not evidence from fossils yet to to show that his theory was correct and that he was expecting the discovery of fossils to eventually confirm his theory. But if it could be shown from the fossils that uh, there had not been an improvement in species over time, mm-hmm. uh, then his theory would not stand up. He was honest enough to say that. Wow. So how, how do you believe, based on your being an archaeologist as well as, as an international explorer, and I'm sure you've talked to your colleagues about this many times, how did we evolve? Was there such a thing as extraterrestrial intervention, or were are or are humans a product of this planet? They are the product of this planet. I have not the slightest doubt about that. Um, in fact, everything that we point to extraterrestrials for can be explained by things here on Earth without having to go off this planet. Why do you think, sir? that people look to the skies for the answers instead of looking to the ground and what's already been accomplished by people of this planet and what you, the members of the scientific community and archaeologists, are finding and are saying this is what happened. It has nothing to do with E.T. going home or even coming here. Yes, well, that's a big subject, uh, Robin, and there's quite a number of reasons. Um, I, I do know that um, ET uh, promoters uh, often look, go to ancient documents and they say, well, these people saw, saw people coming out of the sky and they yeah. looked upon them as gods, etc. But that's happened in our day. Yes. Uh, it's in Papua New Guinea during World War II, the, the, the American planes, the Japanese planes were coming over and, and Americans established bases and the natives looked upon and, and they gave them gifts, which mm-hmm. were things they had never seen before. And, and primitive natives looked at people who were living in a primitive style. I mean, they, they weren't primitive in their intelligence, but they were superstitious because they didn't know it, the outside world. They, they began to look upon these visitors as gods who had come from the skies. I think you'll appreciate this uh, scenario that I often talk about here on the show, is that what would happen if the Bible, or if all the events that happened in the Bible that are written about were to happen today, with our knowledge of science, chemistry, biology, physics, astronomy, how would the Bible have been written? Or would it have been written at all? Well, uh, having studied that question quite deeply, because I, I think it's a good question and it does come up frequently, uh, I do believe that uh, the Bible is... I mean, uh, I believe there's good evidence, structural evidence, that the Bible is not man's ideas about God, but it actually was a revelation from our Creator. So that may put a cat among the pigeons, but I do believe that uh, the Bible is a very accurate history of our past, but shows God's dealings with mankind. All right, if God wasn't an extraterrestrial, who was he? Uh, he's outside time and outside space, so he's not a, he's not subservient to space right. as extraterrestrials would be, or to time. But if we look upon creation as being the the result of his action right. in the universe, he is outside and above time and space. Okay. Now, how would we, or how would you, as a member of the scientific community? As an archaeologist, how would you explain his existence if there are no artifacts to his actual being? Well, if we if we see a a, a computer, mm-hmm. uh, and and we try to explain that this computer formed itself over millions of years, we know it couldn't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. And if we couldn't, if there was no computer yesterday, there wouldn't suddenly appear a computer today. And we say, well, time might make the difference. So therefore, it would take millions of years for a piece of something, a piece of goo, to form into a solid computer. Um, you would you'd laugh me out of town. I know you would. No, no one would accept that, that my reasoning was was sound. And no, yet we know, because we know that it takes intelligence to make a computer, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, when we look at the DNA in our bodies, where everything is programmed to work together and and certain uh, programs are obviously like a computer, we have to say the human body had to have been designed and created. It could not have appeared gradually, piece by piece, because so many interlocked, interdependent parts needed to appear at the same time together instantly. 
So would it be safe to say, using that hypothesis, that there are other planets in the universe that also sustain life? And if that is the case, why is it not possible that we have been visited by extraterrestrials? I do believe that there are other planets in the universe that sustain life. Mm -hmm. Um, The fact is that we are are here, uh, we've been created, I I have no question about that. And a lot of scientists now are turning back to this point. Uh, Darwin diverted them, but now many are saying, "Well, we, we've been we've been wrongly led. Uh, let's get back to the the basics: uh, the design and intelligence that we see in artifacts of living beings, men, animals, trees, and so on, indicates in an intelligent uh, personality behind all this." Okay. Wow. Now. Um, what was, what's your question again? I was just leading up to it, and I forgot where we went to. I was saying that um, if if we oh, were yes. designed, you yes. know, about other life and extraterrestrials visiting this planet. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now, the, the fact is that um, there, there must be extraterrestrials out there, of mm-hmm. course. But uh, the, the reason for them to visit this planet or rather, shall I, shall I say, the likelihood of them visiting this planet, a scientist have calculated the mathematical odds of this and, and said that it's very remote that suddenly uh, we would see all these thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of manifestations of extraterrestrials on this tiny little planet. Uh, there, if there are so many other planets out there, uh, why why should they visit this planet? So many of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the odds of that being so uh, are so minuscule as to be almost remotely impossible. Well, you know what? That brings us to another question. What would happen if we are the oldest of the planets or the oldest of the people that God created and other planets where the, that are populated by other beings like ourselves are not to our present evolutionary state. So therefore they cannot travel to other planets yet. Well, we can raise all these hypothetical yeah. questions and, and I, my answer has to be that we, uh, we can only speculate. There is no, we, we can't go by evidence. And as an archaeologist, I really do like to go by evidence for everything that I promote. And as a broadcaster, I have to go by the clock on the wall. We've got to take our final break. Please stand by, Jonathan. Great having you with us. ExoNation, Jonathan Gray is our special guest all the way from New Zealand. He's an international explorer, and his website is www.beforeus.com. I'm sorry, beforeus.com. That's B-E-F-O-R-E-U-S dot com. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we do our wrap-up for tonight. Don't go away. With each new extreme weather event or terrorist act, it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times. We all buy car insurance. Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go-bag, Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com and author signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. That's www.whentechfails.com and www.mattstein.com. 